Fear does not exist in this dojo. Pain does not exist in this dojo. Lack of bow control happens to the best of us, especially in a ricochet stroke. I'm Nathan Cole from natesviolin.com. And actually ricochet comes up surprisingly often, um, for example, in Bazzini's Dance of the Goblins, right? Uh, there, or in the Paganini's first concerto, in the third movement, solo entrance starts right off with a... And of course, quite common in a Rossini's William Tell overture, runs throughout the whole thing. So full control over ricochet means that you can play evenly at any tempo, synced up with the fingers of the left hand, and in the case of that Rossini, also synced up with, you know, could be 15 other violinists playing the same thing at the same time. So, what do we study here? The way of the fist, strike first, strike hard. We'll get to all of that, but first, remember that with ricochet, like the other off the string strokes, a great way to figure out what your bow should be doing is to find the on string equivalent. So what do I mean by that? If you consider a basic spiccato, you know, you might have four. Got all kinds of aggression dynamic sounds. Now, let's say that we're gonna play them all in the same tempo, but with different sounds. Every one of those has an on the string equivalent, right? So that basic kind of soft might have the spikier one. All right, so everyone has that equivalent sound on the string. You know, I'm changing the bow speed. In other words, how much bow, amount of bow, bow pressure or the depth into the string and contact point distance from the bridge. That's the classic three variables. And most problems with ricochet happen because the way we're trying to use the bow at the moment doesn't match the sound that we have in our head. So if you want a more detailed look at that, check out my video, Spiccato Off and On. It's another video here on YouTube. So let's take that Rossini once more. Those are just two notes, ricochet, right? So what would they sound like on the string Let's try to match the dynamic, the sound. Trying to match the sound of the surrounding notes. Okay, so I've got a good idea. I've got a certain amount of bow. It's pretty little bow, actually. A certain amount of pressure. It's, you know, I could give it a number, but it's, it's a, somewhere on the lesser end of pressure. My contact point, you know about there, whatever that is. That feels about right for this figure. So I could probably get close with the ricochet just by throwing my bow down right there, using the same amount of bow, same contact point. And now here's where the way of the fist comes in, because I don't want or need active fingers for this. They'd only get in the way. So here's the on-string stroke one more time. You could actually just do that with a fist, right? And now if I just throw it down, it's pretty much right there. Same contact point, same amount of bow, same basic pressure. So I won't persist with the way of the fist in performance, obviously. So when I now put the fingers back on the bow, I want them firm. You know, they should resist a lot of pulling. Yeah, if I'm pulling the tip of the bow here, I don't want them flopping all around. So firm, but passive. They're basically just along for the ride here. So let's try to find the way of the fist for those other examples. Let's see, Dance of the Goblins. So on the string. And no, look, I've got a different contact point here, right? I'm actually feeling quite a bit into the string as well for these faster notes. The way of the fist hopefully will still get us close to that, so... Great. 
putting the fingers back on there will be a child's play. How about the Paganini? That's even faster now. It's quite aggressive too. I don't necessarily need the cleanest sound. How would that be on the string? That's quite a bit of pressure, I would say. Contact point, perhaps even a little closer to the bridge. Switch to the fist. Now throw it down. Yeah, I'd say that's getting this close. So, once again, it's a nice way to remember what the fingers do, what they don't do. Biggest thing I have to experiment here with here is the height of the throw, right? From how far off the string is it? Mm. Is it really close? Somewhere in the middle? Right. So in general, for louder, more aggressive ricochet, you throw it from higher. Now that's going to get us close. You can feel free to stop the video right here, unless you want to get nerdier. Let's face it, if you are here, you probably do. So, a little bit more of what some people call a deep dive. With normal on the string playing, right, we've got three variables. Amount of bow, or bow speed. I'm going to call it amount from here on out because what I'm going to call speed is the speed of the ricochet notes. So we've got amount of bow, bow pressure and contact point, but with the ricochet we also have that other thing, the height of the throw. Amount of bow, easy to understand, contact point, easy to understand. Bow pressure in ricochet, that's going to be the force of our throw, right? I could have a high throw with no pressure at all. So bow pressure in our classic three variables, that's going to be the force of the throw. So we've got our main three ones plus the height of the throw. And so just like when you're studying the regular three variables for on the string playing, it's a little bit like that, uh, the problem with the fox, the chicken, and the bag of corn. I don't know if you've ever done that, where you can't leave the fox alone with the chicken and you can't leave the chicken alone with the corn, but the farmer has to, there's something and they go to cross a river. So same with the three variables, or in this case four. You can't change just one because they're dependent on each other. You'll see what I mean if you take, let's say we took that Rossini again. I'm going to slow it down a little bit. In one case, I'm going to do two ricochet notes. Now I'm going to do four. So twice as fast. Basically, I want them to have the same sound, same dynamic. Let's make sure that I'm doing that. Or pretty much the same. The on-string equivalent is going to be basically the same for those, right? But I must be changing something to get those notes twice as fast. So what am I changing? How do you know what to do? The thing you want to nail, right, is the speed of the ricochet. Because if you can get that, the rest is sort of icing on the cake. That will at least let you sync up with the left hand. It'll let you sync with other players or a pianist. So here's how these different things affect speed. Force affects speed. The force of the throw. Greater force equals faster notes, right? And that makes sense. If I put no force whatsoever, the bow is just allowed to start bouncing very slowly in the beginning. So more force forces the bow back to the string. Right. So more force equals faster notes. The height of the throw affects the speed, right? So a higher throw or a higher bounce equals slower ricochet. You could think if you want of skipping a stone where those first few skips on the water are really spread out as they get closer together and lower, they get faster. So higher equals slower, lower equals faster. So from here compared to here, dropping from low. Amount of the bow affects speed. If I use more bow, those skips are slower as well. Same thing, skipping a stone. So if I use just a little bow, those are very fast. 
doesn't matter what height. If I use more bow, low bow, we'll try it there. Fast with a little bow, slower with more bow. And finally, the contact point will also affect the speed. If I'm out at the very springy part of the string by the fingerboard, it's going to bounce slower. It's like being on a trampoline. Here, closer to the bridge, much faster. If you take speed to the extreme and you got infinitely fast, right? Eventually, that bow is just going to stick on the string. All motion is going to stop on the string. Infinitely slow would mean the bow would stay in the air. And that's why you can't just throw the bow down with maximum force for ricochet, right? What happens if you do? It, it just stops right on the string because we are infinitely fast, okay? Therefore, if I'm going to throw with a lot of force like that, I must do something else to slow down the ricochet. What could I do? I could use more bow. I could have a higher throw. I could be further out and I might do all those things. So instead of now I'm going to use more bow and be further out. And now I get a quality sound again. So you can play with the variables if you really want to understand how to get exactly the sound that you want. Last thing I'll have to say about that is that the, the general quality of the sound, how round it is, or aggressive, basically has to do with, it's like a fraction, it's the height of your bounce compared to the amount of the bow. So if, you're, if you've only got a little height and a lot of bow, it's either going to be so round or so, so flaky, it's more like a ponticello sound very gentle. The aggressive one would be a lot of height compared to the amount of bow. So you can understand all those if you want or simply experiment. That's what I've done most of my life. These uh, last few minutes were for those of you who wanted to really get into the weeds with it. So hope you enjoyed this look at Ricochet. You'll be able now to use the way of the fist to get just the speed you want and from there refine your sound. And check out natesviolin.com for lots more videos, tips, and tricks. I'll see you soon.